want to um, I want to talk to us about change. There's a lot of change going on in the world right now. And I want to remind yourself and myself that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And our life now is to live for him in all areas of life. I often talk about three journeys we're on, you know, the, the inward journey, which is for you. And then that inward journey, we get physical healing, we get spiritual healing, we get impartation, we get scripture knowledge and good theology and doctrine and good stuff in and bad stuff out. That's what we all need. Would you agree? That's the inward journey for you. Then, then there's the upward journey that is not about you anymore. It's all about God. You know, from John 4, the Father is seeking for those who will worship him, love him in spirit and in truth. And you have to ask the question, what does God get out of all this? This is a lot of effort on his part. What's in it for him? Well, he gets you. And he gets me. And he's hoping that we'll learn to love him with all of our heart and all of our soul. That's why Jesus gave us that as, as the great commandment. So that's the upward journey. And number three is the outward journey where we take what we know and what we've learned and we share Jesus with the whole world. And the great commission from Matthew 28 is... Uh, Jesus starts off by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. That's quite a statement. How much does that leave for the other guy? Zero, none. He has it all. And then he says, so therefore go and preach the good news and make disciples of all nations. And so that's our assignment. It doesn't say win everybody doesn't say take the mountains, doesn't say win your town. It just says tell them so that many will respond and those who don't at least have been warned that judgment day is coming. So why wait? And if you're here tonight and you're not ready for judgment day, I don't know how you get ready for that apart from inviting Jesus into your life. And, and, and deal with the sin issue so that before the Lord we stand and say, um, yeah, I'm guilty of a whole load of things, but Jesus forgave me and paid my debt so I can stand righteous before God. That's where we want to go. And I want to just emphasize one of the important things we do is Holy Spirit encounters. When you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, uh, Carol said it's her pet peeve when, when people get up too soon. <laughs> and the reason is that when you're lying on the floor and everybody's looking at you and some are laughing and this and that, and, and you're like, I got to get up. And, and that's the wrong choice. What you've got to do is lie there and get every last drop of what God wants to pour in. So these Holy Spirit encounters are so important. And all of this is preparing us for eternity. Now, do you know that the big event is the next life? It's not so much this life. I, I hope you're doing well in this life and you're debt free and mortgage free and all that. But you are being prepared for that which is soon to come. And I think we're living on the very edge of time right now of the coming of the Lord is so close at hand and yet I believe there's a lot to do in the meantime to get ready. We are just on the very edge of the greatest move of God the world has ever seen. 
In fact, it's, it's happening in many, many places of the world right now. I was just reading a book about stories of what God's doing in the Muslim world. It's unbelievable how many of them are having um, dreams and visions of the man in white who's saying, come and follow me, and so on. It's, it's just an unprecedented time. And all of us know that uh, something's going on in the world right now, right? Have you noticed? Plague? Is there no end to this COVID? I mean, we got in the airport, put on your mask. We got on Air Canada, had to wear the thing all the way to Edmonton. And, uh, yeah, two years ago when all this fell on us, I could not believe that the entire world was shut down. I mean, we got friends almost in every nation. I'd call them in Japan and in in New Zealand and Australia and India and South Africa and all over the U.S. and all over Europe, the same story. Yeah, we're all shut down here. Nobody can leave their home. Got to wear a mask, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, what in the world is happening? Plagues. And then war now. Two nations being destroyed. Ukraine and Russia. And they're supposed to be, you know, close um, brothers. What the heck is going on with that? It It doesn't make any sense to anybody. And yet there we are. It could be threatening a global famine, they say. Everybody's asking, what's up? What's up with the weather? You know, England had the hottest day ever a week ago. And uh, there's all these fires breaking out. I called my daughter today, Lori, and, who lives in Birmingham, England. She's she, they finally figured out what the uh, what the fires are starting from. It's everybody has their little um, pile of, of what do you call that stuff where you pile your leaves and everything? Compost pile. It's so hot over there. All the compost piles are igniting, it's, it's burning all the grass. Some people, some houses burnt down. All that kind of stuff. It's amazing what's going on. Is this God at work? Is this the devil? Just what? Life is such a random, convoluted journey. And many of us are kind of looking over our shoulder saying, I'm missing the good old days. Anybody here doing that? When are we going to get back to normal? Anybody said that? Besides me? (laughs) Well, that's what I want to talk about. Because um, we're called to step into something that may be changing our world forever. I want us to just consider briefly the life of King David in, in the scriptures. You know, David was out minding his own business and God called him. And uh, when all the sons were assembled before Samuel, uh, they didn't think about the youngest one. And Samuel says, he's not here. Like, where's the youngest one? Where's, have you got any more sons? He said, well, the young one's out watching the sheep. Go get him. We can't eat till he comes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So David's anointed king, and it went okay for a while. You know, he, he was emboldened, and he took out Goliath, and he was a champion in the army. Saul promoted him, gave him the hand of one of his daughters to marry. But pretty soon he got jealous of him, and it went from bad to worse until David's the most wanted guy in the nation. And uh, there's a bunch of followers that started with about 400 and ended up being 600, and they were the outlaws and the ne'er-do-wells and the whatevers following David. And they're hiding for their lives. And finally, they said, 
we got to get out of this country because Saul won't let it go. So they went to the Philistines. Now I want you and I to relate to this a little bit because in life it can go hard sometimes. And we, we're trying to figure it out what's going wrong. And maybe you had a prophetic word like David did. Hey, you're going to be king one day. And that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? How many of you have had a really great prophetic word at some point? And then you're like, when is it ever going to come? All these 600 guys, they were following David because they believed in him. He was a champion in the army. And he was anointed. But why is this taking 40 years, for goodness sake, or such a long time? And... So anyway, he leaves Israel and goes to be among the Philistines. And the day came when there's war between Israel and the Philistine army. So David and his men dutifully present themselves to the Philistines and say, we'll go and help you. And they say, nothing doing. Go back home. Send them back home. And so they're, they're hurt now. They're, they're like going back home defeated. Like not even the Philistines don't want us. Did you ever feel that way? Ugh. Rejection's a horrible thing. But you see, people can reject you, but it's not the same as God rejecting you. And I want you to just appreciate the difference. So they go back home only to find that their city, their town of Ziklag, has been burnt to the ground and everything's gone. And you, you can read about it in, uh, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 30. Talks about that happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had invaded the south of Ziklag and attacked it and burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there, the small and the great, and did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men uh, came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. This is the worst day in David's life right here. Sometimes in the, in the outworkings and in the inworkings of God, um, he puts you in a postgraduate school where you can learn how to be a ruler and how to be a king. Kind of like what happened to Joseph as happening here to David. The relentless grinding down of self-will and the, and the need to continuously throw yourself on the Lord. And this is what David did here. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord as God. And he said to Abiathar, please bring the ephod to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. The ephod is a is a leather plaque that had of the stones of each of the tribes of Israel on it. And somehow or other, they lit up one way or another to give them a yes or a no. It's called the Urim and Thummim in places. We don't know much about it. That's about all we do know. David said to Abia, bring it. And David inquired of the Lord, verse 8, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you will surely overtake them and without fail recover all. 
So David's hope that day was that they would recover their stuff, their wives, their children, and their belongings. And I think if that's all that had happened, he would have been satisfied for another while. What do you think? And we're kind of in that place right now. God, if we could just get back to the way it was a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, when things were working. Do you remember when customer service was a reality? I don't know about out here, but customer service just went somewhere in Toronto. And I jokingly said, listen, if you want customer service, you need to go to Mexico now. Because they still care and they're still nice when you're talking to them in a store and stuff. You can still get people on the phone. You know, I called up about a, a visa card issue. You know, I waited for over an hour on the phone. And the guy said something like, well, you'll have to check into this and call us back. I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Have you any idea how long the wait is to call you back? No, I want, I want to deal with this right now, please, if that's okay. But see, part of me wants, if we could just get back to the way it used to be. I remember when air service was really, really tops. So almost all the time the plane left on time. And he landed on time, and when you got through immigration, your bags would be there, and off you go. I mean, it was, I say to Carol, hey, we've, we flew and have flown for many years in the golden age of air travel. And so now we can mobilize this massive prayer team, pray that the plane takes off on time, you know. Pray they don't cancel the flight, all this kind of stuff. And we had a great flight out here this time. I got to say, prayer works, you know, when you start praying for this stuff. But we want that. We want to get back. If we could just get back to the way it was, we'd be happy. But what if God has us in transition and he's getting us ready for a massive breakthrough? <laughs> David stayed three more days in Ziklag, and then he got word about what happened with the battle. And it wasn't good news for him in a way. Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. Uh, the other sons of Saul are dead. And Israel was defeated, and everybody ran home, and the Philistines won the day. Well, David went after the uh, army that took all their stuff, and they did recover everything. They got their wives back, their kids back, their dog back, their truck back. They got it all. And then he says, Lord, what do I do? He began to ask again. See, when you get up against things, one of the best things you can do is seriously get before the Lord and ask him, what do we do? And he says, shall I go up to one of the cities in Judah? And the Lord says, yes, go up. Well, to which one? And the Lord told him. Uh, Go to, oh, it's right in the tip of my tongue. Come on. So he did. And when they got there, do you know what happened? They anointed him king over Judah. So David went from outlaw to king over Judah in about three days. That's what you call transition. Seven years later, he's king over the whole nation. And I believe that we're in a time like that right here, right now. 
And part of us would be happy to just get our stuff back and uh, just get back the way it was four years ago. But I think we're in a regime change just kind of like David was right now. I want you to remember that God is preparing you to be a ruler over his kingdom uh, and help him rule and reign on this earth one day when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. You know, if you read the story in Daniel chapter 2, the story is about Nebuchadnezzar having a dream and he wouldn't tell anybody what, his, what the dream was because he figured they'd spin it or make something up. And he wanted, to, if you know what the dream, if you could tell me the dream, then I can trust your interpretation. Nobody could do it, of course. And so he's like, okay, kill them all. But Daniel broke through and he came and said, here's your dream. You dreamt this great image, the head of gold and arms of of silver and a body of brass and legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And then he told them what they all mean. You're the head of gold, Babylon. Then Medes and Persia comes after you. Then Alexander and the Greeks come after that. And then Rome, west and east, comes after that. And after that, then the feet of iron and clay, like the clay represents people. That These are democracies. And in the days of those kings, he says, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom and that kingdom will never be destroyed. I want you to know that's where we're going. Now, that dream was about 600 BC. So here we are 2,600 years afterwards and all that stuff has happened down to the present time where we're in the times of the democracies, the feet of iron and clay, partly weak, partly strong. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven is going to set up his kingdom. And he goes on and says, the, you saw a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And it flew and s smashed the image on the feet and the whole thing disintegrated and blew away like a cloud of dust. But that, mount, that, that stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Turn to somebody and say, that's the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. That's what you were for. That's what you were born to. That's why you were born again. And he's looking for people who will come out victorious and be an overcomer through all the trials and tests of life. And David did that. Have you ever had, like many of you have had a prophetic word? And I bet there were people in David's day that said, eh, some prophetic word you got, where is it? It's been 20 years, where is it? And people say stuff like that to you. I want you to hang on to your dream. Hang on to your dream. You know, God doesn't work in a reasonable length of time sometimes. You know, he waits till you're 80 years old and then uses you, you know, like Moses. and <laughs> Right? David had a great word. You young men are a champion. You're going to be the, the king of all of Israel one day. True word. But there were days when it sure didn't look like it. And when you have disappointment after disappointment and narrow escape after narrow escape, you're kind of thinking, well, why don't we just salvage what we can and make the most of it? And he wanted to just recover his stuff. And the Lord said, yeah, you'll recover it. But see, God had not forgot his promise to David. You're going to be the king, son. You have a heart after God. And I want to say that to you tonight. Don't let go of your dream. How many have had a promise from the Lord that is yet unfulfilled? There's half of us. 
hang on. The season is just about upon us. Not only are we going to recover all, but there's a tremendous promotion coming because we are about to enter into the time of the greatest harvest the world has ever known. Now, I long for the day that every person in the meeting is healed. And years ago, we'd go to Catherine Kuhlman's meeting and saw such mighty miracles happening over and over again, wheelchairs and on and on. And she would say, I'm, I'm so sorry for those of you who are going home disappointed and you didn't get your healing, but we're looking forward to the time when every person is healed in the meeting just like they were in the meetings that Jesus led. So that was her dream. That's kind of one of mine, too. And thank you for that story, whoever told it. I forgot about that lady that was brought back to life that day. That was a great miracle. We'd love to meet that lady. Do you, do you know her, Johnny? Do you know who she is? Does she still come out? Once in a while. Huh? She's a little older. Yeah, she's, she's six months older now. <laughs> Families here. Well, bless her wherever she is. But we're contending for this, friends. I'm telling you, the greatest harvest the world has ever seen is just on the horizon. The greatest miracles that you've ever seen as you laid hands on someone and prayed for them are just on the horizon. And you know, part of me is like tired. I'm tired of prophecy that's saying tomorrow, it's coming tomorrow, it's coming next week, coming down the road. I'm like, Lord, we're ready now. We think we are. But then I kind of backed off and said, no, I want it to happen when you think it's right. Because I trust your timing a whole lot better than I trust my own. Right? But we're heading into this time. And so, don't get disillusioned, friends. Don't give up. Just encourage one another. See, David was smart enough to know in the deepest, darkest, most painful day of your life is the very time that you want to turn and strengthen yourself in the Lord. Because there's no other place to go. Where are you going to go? Do you remember when Jesus told them all, hey, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no life in you? And people went, oh, I vey, like, who can hear this? And, and they, they started going away, like hundreds, thousands of them. And he said to the 12, are you guys going to? That's an that's a interesting question. I could, ask, I could ask me that. I could ask you that. Are you going to leave him too? And Peter said, well, where else would we go? You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. So no, we're sticking with you. I don't understand everything you say. I don't understand everything you do. But what I understand, I really like. And I'm not going anywhere, Lord. I'm going to strengthen myself in the Lord. And we need to do that in these days because we're being stretched and tested, a lot of us. And I dare say some of you in your, in your business, that you, you almost didn't make it. And maybe some of you didn't make it. And you got to think about starting again or now what? All kinds of people, their businesses just couldn't stay shut for two years. And picking up those pieces, saying, God, I don't understand what's going on. He's getting you ready to be a ruler in the millennial kingdom. And that kingdom is more sure than tomorrow's sunrise. So I want to encourage you. Now, if you've been discouraged, I don't want shame to get all over you. But it's good to just acknowledge, right? 
Why don't we all stand and we'll get ready to close. But if you've been discouraged, maybe even super discouraged, I want you unashamedly to just lift your hand up high and say, yeah, I have been. This last three years have almost been the end of me. If your hand is raised and you feel it's right, I want you to come and gather around the front here so I can pray with you. Just come quickly. Yeah, come on. Squeeze in. They're still coming down the aisles. Isn't it amazing how we can have such a good time in church and sing and shout and jump and everything, and yet there's a sadness in our spirit because we don't understand what's going on. And I'm telling you, we're heading for a regime change. Right? God is about to make the church the head and not the tail. We're going to see the greatest harvest that I believe will eclipse what happened in the book of Acts and in the first couple of centuries of the church. It's going to be so powerful, the world isn't going to believe it. And along with it, uh, soon on the heels of it, will be terrible trouble, according to Scripture. But you know what? You're getting, you're, you're being made ready for what God is about to do on the earth. So I want you to say to yourself, don't quit finish well finish strong in the name of Jesus help me Lord to finish well in the name of Jesus I'm going to set my face on seeking you so I can carry the anointing that you want to pour out of my life I want you to shake that discouragement off of you. Come on, just shake it. Throw it down on the floor and stomp it. We're not having that. Listen, your name is written in heaven. When you come out of these bodies of yours, when you leave your earth suit behind, you're going to glory. Met by the angels. Oh, it's, it's an incredible day. We had a dear friend just died recently. She's with the angels right now. We're happy for her. And those of us who are still here, the best years of your life are just ahead. So hang on, dear Christian. Think of David. When all he wanted was to recover his stuff. And the Lord says, no, no, we're going way beyond that. We're having a regime change, David. You are going to be king of Judah and then all of Israel. Jesus said, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it even entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Lord, nothing can separate us from your love. Only our own discouragement. And so we throw discouragement out of our being 
and we say, we're going to seek you. We're going to be strong on the Lord in the power of his might. So, Lord, open up my heart and make it, make it possible for me to drink deeply from that fountain of living water where Jesus told the woman at the well, If you drink the water that I will give you, it will bubble up in you living water. Eternally, you'll never thirst again. Thank you, Father, that you brought us safely thus far and you'll lead us all the way home. I want you to see yourself as a dread champion in the kingdom where the enemy's afraid that you're going to wake up and realize the authority that is yours and the anointing and power that is yours and begin to use it against the kingdom of darkness. Sheikha Barabasi. I bless you all. In the mighty name of Jesus, I lift that discouragement off of you. Go. Shame and fear, go. Pain and disappointment, go from them. Kingdom of God, come. Let your holy fire burn on us tonight. In the name of Jesus, Father, burn on them. Every word that's spoken over you that said, ha, huh, you, that is so laughable. I break those words off of you. And I free you to be the man of God and the woman of God that you're created to be. So stand tall in your Savior's love. And never forget he has plans for you in his kingdom. He has spoken encouraging prophetic words over you. Some of you are going to get them again tomorrow. We want them, Lord. They give us life and hope and peace. Bring them about. Bring them to pass, I pray. Answer prayer, Lord Jesus. And lift your people to be the mighty army that you have planned for us to be. Where we boldly speak out and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I worship you, Jesus. Just come and find your home deep within our own hearts. We welcome you home in our hearts. And if you've just gotten discouraged to the point where you've almost given up, I want you to renew your faith right now and say, Lord, I needed this word tonight. And I'm coming back to you. I'm not going to let anything separate me from the love of God. Can tribulation or distress or persecution? No, none of these things. Because in him, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Just say, yes, Lord, with you, I am a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer, Lord. How many want to be overcomers? Wave at me. All right, listen carefully. Overcomers are going to need a few things to overcome. And that gives you the victory, doesn't it? Fill them up with that overcoming loving power.
power of the Holy Spirit. There's no toxic levels of the Holy Spirit, friends. The more you get, the better it is. Oh God, teach us to just get before you and soak in your power and soak in your fire and soak in your love. Strengthen us for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Seal all of these healings that we had tonight, I pray. And fill your people with that joy unspeakable that's full of glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, just um, as we're in this atmosphere, maybe some of our ministry team, if you can just start coming through and just praying for those that want prayer. Um, John's going to stay and just be, continue to pray. But Lord, we just, we just thank you, Father. We thank you. Man, what a powerful message that was tonight of just calling us into so many greater things. But first, Lord, you want to restore uh, what the enemy has stolen. And Lord, you're not going to stop there, but you're going to keep going. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you tonight for what you're doing. And we just bless these people here tonight, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in, in this moment. And God, we ask that you would just continue to breathe on every heart here and every life. In Jesus' name. Amen.